Live from the European Parliament in Strasbourg, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us this evening and this is what we have in the program for you. Power shift. European Parliament elects its new president in a series of votes in Strasbourg. Top jobs anger. Reaction to the council's picks for commission president and prime posts including EU first Ursula von der Leyen to become the first woman in the top job. And shut out why no lead candidates made the cut and what it means for democracy. And street cred, a look back at the next commission president's action-packed career in today's Raw Moment. All right, it is time to meet our panelists this evening. So joining us is Jan Zardil. He is a Czech MEP from the European Conservatives and Reformists Group and a runner-up today for the Parliament President Post. Hello, Jan. What are you watching closely today? Maybe we can guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, I was watching my numbers. <laughs> All right, OK. Also joining us uh, tonight, Paul Tang, a Dutch MEP from the Socialists and Democrats Group. What about you, Paul? Yeah, well, uh, the election of the president uh, of the parliament and, of course, uh, the proposal by the council of Ursula von Leyen. Right. 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 Big day for, well, with a lot of big names, and that is exactly where we are beginning tonight. Because after months of back-and-forth political bargaining, deadlock, disappointment, and, of course, that mammoth summit, the European Union finally has its top job nominations, with Germany's Ursula von der Leyen to become the next commission president. And this morning, a decision on the fifth and final name. MEPs here in Strasbourg were called to the chamber to vote for the new president of the European Parliament. And after just two ballots, it was this man who clinched it, Italian socialist David Sassoli. There he is. With a majority of votes, he takes the baton from former president Antonio Tajani to lead the assembly for the next two and a half years. Now, in his first uh, speech, uh, leader, he warned against a return to nationalism and he urged Europe to speak with a single voice. Dobbiamo recuperare lo spirito dei padri fondatori, lo spirito di Ventotene, di coloro che seppero mettere da parte le ostilità della guerra, porre fine ai guasti del nazionalismo dandoci un progetto capace di coniugare pace, democrazia, diritti, sviluppo e uguaglianza. In questi mesi in troppi hanno scommesso sul declino di questo progetto alimentando anche divisioni e conflitti che pensavamo essere un triste ricordo della nostra storia. I cittadini hanno dimostrato invece di credere ancora in questo straordinario progetto. All right, for more, let's go to our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, who is joining us from the Hemicycle, where it all took place just a few hours ago. Darren, so, I mean, the MEPs here know who he is, but maybe the general public, they don't know who he is. So can you tell us who is David Sassoli? Tell us about the nomination and how we got here. Well, indeed, he's not exactly a household name across Europe. It must be said he is a household name in Italy, a bit like you, Tessa. He has spent a lot of time in a newsroom delivering the news to Italians on the state broadcaster for many, many years. And he finally made that switch uh, to politics uh, back in 2009. He's been an MEP essentially for the last uh, 10 years, a pretty popular one at that, it must be said. When he was first elected, he got a whopping 400,000 votes. Uh, but the 63-year-old um, has served as vice president and has managed to get this position very much as a socialist candidate from the centre-left. It must be said he's not a big fan of the current Italian government, and that's certainly of Matteo Salvini. But clearly, his position is part of this wider package that the Council have uh, put uh, forward. Uh, Donald Tusk suggesting uh, yesterday that uh, the Parliament president, at least for the first half of the term, should be a socialist. And, of course, he's also an Italian, handing from one Italian, uh, Antonio uh, Tajani, to another. And it means that, actually, the Italians who have already lost Mari Draghi in the ECB and Federico Mogherini uh, uh, in the uh, high representative uh, still have a key position, uh, as do the socialists. So quite a significant figure in Italy and potentially a name that we might get used to beyond that in the months and years to come. All right, thank you for that, uh, Darren. For now, um, I'd like to go to you. Jan, you were the runner-up uh, today, so congratulations on that. But, you know, you've been a big uh, supporter of having an Eastern European ahead, at least in one of the top jobs, and that didn't happen. Are you disappointed then? 
Uh, yes, of course I am. I think that uh, uh, this package is, is geographically disbalanced uh, because all top jobs were taken by old member states, by Eurozone states, uh, by, let's say, uh, uh, members of the hardcore of the European Union and also by big states, with one exception, this hey. is Belgium. So I think that uh, there is a clear geographical disbalance. But what about David Sassoli as a Parliament uh, President? Does, does that disappoint you as well? Uh, I don't know him, uh, frankly <laughs> speaking. Uh, he hasn't been the most visible uh, parliamentarian uh, since I've been here. And uh, he's been, uh, at least as far as I remember, he's been elected by the narrowest possible majority of every EP president I can remember, okay. uh, which means that probably that package uh, doesn't work that much at all because there must have been a lot of defections from uh, uh, maybe EPP, maybe Liberal Group, I don't know. And what about your reaction, Paul? You're from the same family. I mean, yeah. uh, David is a socialist and, and so are you from the Socialist Democrats group. He's an Italian. What does this bode for in terms of, of balance? Are you happy with this appointment, with this uh, the election? Yeah, no, I, I think the, re the result was good. And to say he won, uh, even though there were three other candidates in the race. Uh, and David is well known in Italy. He's an, he's an anger man. I know him as a warm person. He smokes, which I also think is an advantage. Uh, but he's also a very good parliamentarian. It's a great heart for the mm. European uh, for the European Parliament. So I think he's a definitely good choice. But to be clear, this is not part of any package, right? So that's right. That, that's a different discussion. We had no, we had to do. So Jan seems. No, no, we we had to start today. We okay. can't we can't not elect a president. Otherwise, we cannot start our work. Right. I, I know you have to go soon. So you were dis you, you were disagreeing with what Paul was saying. Well, partly. I would partly disagree because I think that uh, election of a socialist candidate as an EP president is a probably a pretext to what will happen next when the commission or when the proposal from the European Council comes to the European Parliament. We will see. We will see. But uh, I think that uh, uh, at least uh, SND group, maybe partly EPP, maybe partly mm -hmm. Renew Europe from Liberal Group, we're thinking this way. All right, okay, let's hold it there for a minute because let's go back to uh, Darren McCaffrey, our political editor. There's also been a lot of reaction here to another nomination, that of the German Defense Minister Ursula von der Leyen for Commission President. So, Darren, what have you been hearing? Yeah, well, it must be said that she arrived here at the European Parliament uh, this afternoon, part of a now concerted wooing campaign to try and get MEPs on side uh, behind her nomination. Ultimately, of course, while the council has nominated her, it will be up to MEPs in a couple of weeks' time to decide whether she does become Commission President or not. Uh, now, clearly, she has got the EPP on her side, despite, it must be said, a quite an uncomfortable walk into uh, that meeting this afternoon alongside Manfred Weber, the man who was the lead candidate, Tessa, uh, for that uh, position. I tried to ask a couple of questions uh, of her. Uh, she was not willing uh, to answer them, but for Manfred Weber, it was quite a difficult moment, I think, uh, given that it should, in some ways, he would argue, have been his uh, job. Uh, but that is not to say that everyone is on board. There is real disquiet about this, not least among some socialist MEPs uh, who are not terribly happy. The Greens have also made their frustration uh, about this, not because of who she is, but rather because uh, essentially the council have ditched the, the Spitzen candidate process, the lead candidate process, and the poll wants to vent its frustration to a degree. And also there are concerns about, you know, in many ways, uh, she has not held uh, high office in, uh, to the level of kind of uh, prime ministerial level. Uh, and there are concerns, of course, about her experience, too. Indeed. Uh, let's uh, talk about that, uh, Darren, in terms of her experience, because the criticism, a lot of it, is coming, in fact, from her home country in Germany, because she doesn't have a very good reputation there, apparently, as, as Minister of Defence. Yeah, indeed, she's one of the most unpopular ministers within Angela Merkel's government. Now, many would say that is because she has got a very difficult brief, that of uh, Defence Minister, and she has been there in the job uh, for six years, but, you know, her ministry has been rather scandal-plagued uh, with major equipment problems uh, over the last uh, couple of years. But it must be said, in some ways, uh, she was almost kind of born into this job, born in Belgium uh, to, the, uh, to the daughter of uh, EU uh, officials. Uh, she grew up there before moving uh, to Germany. She speaks fluent French, uh, German and 
uh, English, uh, but she has been compared politically uh, to Hillary Clinton, uh, Germany's Hillary Clinton, Tessa, in many regards. Uh, not just because she's bright, but she can be quite prickly sometimes, but she's also been a big advocate for women in politics. And it is notable, of course, that she would become, if she gets the job, the first woman commission uh, president. Uh, that is not to say, as I say, there is uneasiness within uh, the coalition government in Germany about this. Angela Merkel had to abstain uh, when it came to her nom nomination because of that. Uh, but I think she is highly regarded in Germany. At one stage seen as Angela Merkel's successor, uh, she's now driven this path into European uh, politics. Uh, the big question, of course, is not what she's now done in her past, but where she will take Europe in her future. And interestingly, in a few interviews she's, she's given over the last couple of years, uh, she has talked about a quite a federal European Union, talked about a United States of Europe, a Europe that should work more closely together on things like taxation and finance. Maybe one of the appeals she had uh, for uh, Emmanuel Macron, who also backed her. So an interesting politician, clearly a strong advocate for women's uh, rights, uh, German nonetheless, but someone who was very much in some ways brought up inside this e the EU family. Thanks for that, uh, Darren. And joining us uh, for this panel, we have Alexandra Brzozowski, a reporter from uh, Euractive, specializing in defense policy. And still with us is Paul Tang. So, Alexandra, I'll start with you because you've been covering defense and security in the EU for a while now. So can you tell us a little bit about what maybe what we can expect from, uh, from Ms. von der Leyen on her leadership style and negotiation style? Um, when she came to Brussels, she was a very open figure. So basically her colleagues didn't know her that well so her stance is very transatlantic she's very multilateral based so when she would face Donald Trump she would advocate for multilateralism for open trade for everything in that direction so she is in that regard quite different to her colleagues and um, I think especially under her helm mm -hmm. um, foreign and security policy, defense policy would have a boost because she was very, very um, on Macron's terms. Did so she negotiate hard? She, she is a hard negotiator. Okay. She knows she was called the Iron Lady at some point. So really? she, she knows how to how to exert her mm -hmm. position. Definitely. All right. And Paul, you were shaking your head in much of when, when Darren was reporting there. What do you fundamentally disagree with? Well, first of all, it's a slap in the face for democracy. We have Spitzen candidates making campaign, making their ideas clear. So what you see now is that you have to find out what she thinks about Europe. And this cannot be the, it should not be the case. We should have a candidate that the people have voted for and that has expressed their ideas on Europe and how to so go we forward. Will, we will, yeah, we will talk about the process a little, a little later on. But what I, wa what, what I want to focus now on in, is yeah. Mr. Von, Ms. von der Leyen's uh, credibility and her ability to take on this top post. Are you confident? In that uh, no, no not at all you, you also see that the SPD in her in her home country the, the Social Democrat Party didn't want her to be uh, voted for uh, and she has a rather poor reputation uh, of being a defense minister so she may be a hard negotiator but she was absolutely not in control with uh, unclear contracts for consultants uh, copying or in a PhD thesis, so this is not an uh, uncontested uh, candidate. So, I mean, you're not the you're not the only critic, uh, in fact, because we we so we heard from uh, Mr. Schultz, Martin Schultz. He was a former pre president of the Parliament. In fact, he said that von der Leyen is our weakest minister. That's apparently enough to become Commission president. So, with that kind of criticism before her, what kind of mandate will she have then if she does become a Commission president? Is that the kind of, you know, if that's the kind of atmosphere she's going into, how can she get things done? I mean, when we look at her whole uh, legacy as minister, she was 14 years a minister, so she's definitely a survivor. She will find a way to kind of find her way forward, negotiate with all the parties involved, and she will find a way to shape the commission as she would like to see it. So mm -hmm. it really depends on how much backing she will get in the next uh, couple of weeks. So we will have to see if the, the, com the current package is even approved. So, so that is the big question first. And yeah. then, then I think we can see what, what happens after. Because let's ask the MEP then, will she get the backing from Parliament? Do you think it's, it's going to pass? I think there's a huge resistance uh, mm -hmm. against her. Uh, not the person, uh, though you can get the impression that the weakest link have been sent from Berlin to Brussels. But apart from that, mainly because she's not a Spitzer candidate, uh, that, that she has no clear vision, not 
from her or from the council. Mm. And I will be a huge resistance from the left-hand side and probably from the populist right-hand side. So I think it will be a hard, uh, very hard for her to reach the absolute majority in, the, in this parliament. It's we, going we're to be gonna, more we, drama. We, we have two <laughs> weeks of fighting ahead. Right. And we're going to fight against her, that's for sure. Well, there you go. A fight uh, up ahead. Okay. Well, with the parliament president agreed and the council's nominee for commission president awaiting approval, here are the other names put forward by leaders of the EU28. So we have Christine Lagarde. She's head of the International Monetary Fund. She's up for president of the European Central Bank. Charles Michel, currently interim prime minister of Belgium. He's got the head of the council role. Joseph Borrell, Spain's foreign minister, put forward for the role of foreign affairs chief. All right, Alexandra, I'll go to you about the, that package. That's what we're talking about. This is the group of names that was put forward. Reaction to that and, you know, as you've been covering. Um, I think when we when we look at the whole package, when we look at all of them, everybody has a flaw. So everybody had some kind of affairs in their back uh, history, which uh, unites them. But I think the most indisputed one is probably M Michel, because uh, he, as one of them, has this notion of being a mediator. Mm -hmm. So he might be undisputed, but the rest, um, depending on the on the member states' uh, positions, we we see might face a lot of criticism in the parliament after I mean, all. The point was raised earlier by Jan Zaradil that, you know, you have a French, a German, a Belgian, uh, an Italian, all from the western part of, of Europe. And what does this mean moving forward when you're dealing with issues in a very divided Europe at this moment? Yeah, Charles Michel may be able to build coalition, but he couldn't need that capacity mm. because this is one of the flaws, the geographical balance is not, uh, is not there, so to say. Uh, so that will be one of the issues. We have seen it in the last five years, especially on the issue of asylum and migration. We also saw it in the package that the Visegrad countries took on their own role and were glad, so Viktor Orban said, to topple the, the Spitzenkandidats, first Manfred Weber, then Franz Timmermans. So they, they have a role to play. And they, I think it would have been better if they would have been incorporated, because that, that they would be part of it. Uh, but yeah, that has not occurred. Uh, but then again, von der Leyen will not make it, so we will have a change in the package anyway. So we will come back to this when you say that she will not, she will not <laughs> okay. make it. But in terms of the, in terms of the choices of names, are either of you surprised? Like these are, are, there, are these names just some would say came out of the blue? But are you, are you surprised? Yeah. I mean, to be fair, von der Leyen's name might have come up in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. in background talks. I mean, she was in Paris. Not a front uh, runner, but yes, exactly. It might have she come was up. in Paris two weeks ago. She met Macron. Macron got to know her during the signing of the fighter jet deal. So um, there were suggestions in French government sources that this might have kind of boosted her reputation with him. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to be very fair, the high rep choice right. is a bit surprising, definitely. Right. Um, all right, and quick comment on the names, like uh, Chris, Christine Lagarde I think and all Christine, the other choices. Christine Lagarde is one of the surprises as well. Uh, this is for the first time that the ECB have been a part of the, uh, the president of the ECB. But she's part of the, the IMF, why is that a surprise? Uh, uh, what you see is now the reaction on, uh, on the bond markets. Is she a dove or a hawk? We don't really know. So I think the bond prices went up and the mm. return. But they're showing that she, the markets cast that she is, uh, she's a dove, but that shows that that everyone is unsure what she stands for as well. She might be the director of the IMF, but it doesn't. So it's not a clear view on monetary policy. Again, already reacting, reacting, Paul reacting there, and markets, as Paul was saying. All right, yeah. well, let's talk about uh, Ursula von der Leyen some more and find out what she, who looks set to be the next commission president, well, not according to Paul here, right. what she really thinks. So your news spoke to her last year in her position as German defense minister, and this is what she told us about her vision for European defense. Also ich bin der festen Überzeugung, dass wir die NATO immer brauchen werden für kollektive Verteidigung. Artikel 5, das wird immer NATO bleiben. Ähm, deshalb ist mir wichtig, transatlantisch zu bleiben. Und dennoch müssen wir europäischer werden. Denn ich sehe viele Gebiete, wo äh, die NATO nicht gefragt ist, nehmen wir als Beispiel jetzt aus der Taufe gehoben. Das heißt, wir haben einen Rechtsrahmen für die Europäische Verteidigungsunion. Wir haben einen gemeinsamen Planungsprozess, damit wir eine strategische Kultur auch entwickeln als Europäer. Wann setzen wir denn unsere Kräfte ein? 
right, very quickly, she, she's going to push for a European army if she becomes commission president. Do you think so? Um, she might push for it, but I think between her vision and Macron's vision, there's a decisive yeah. difference. Because he thinks about this common set of forces, single army forces, and she has a bit of a different notion of, of course, we, we want to integrate our mm -hmm. forces, but still with the reservation that there is a step before. So they're not on the same page, in fact. No. Paul, quick uh, reaction to uh, her uh, thoughts. Uh, the, the Germans have always been more reluctant on, uh, on a European army. And besides, if she wants to translate Atlantic a relation, it may not be a good start mm. with the European army. So interesting to see what will happen there. All right. OK, so you still have a lot more coming up on the program. The question we're asking is democracy in the EU at risk? Will voters weigh in on that debate? Plus, we also have Top Jobs frustration. We talked to MEPs here in Strasbourg about their concerns. Now, that is coming up. We have proposed Ursula von der Leyen as the next president of the European Commission. All right, that was the current EU Council President Donald Tusk speaking there. Now, after a three-day-long summit, EU leaders finally decided on their choice, shutting out the lead candidates who spent months campaigning in the run-up to the European elections. And that got voters reacting on social media. So Alex and our team in the Cube have more on the reaction. Alex. Well, hey, Tessa, remember, remember these guys, you know, Manfred Weber, Franz Timmermans, Scar Keller, Guy Verhofstadt, you know, the lead candidates, the ones running for Europe's top job, who we were told our votes would influence them and their parties becoming perhaps the largest group. Therefore, one of these people could become the next commission president. Remember all that? Yeah, well, none of that came to pass. In fact, let's just show you exactly how this looked. Uh, yeah, that's how it went. None of them got the top job in the end. And that was not lost on the voters. Let's just bring you up what some people were saying. Well, this is a really interesting exchange from John Worth here. Look at this. He's talking with the betting firm Ladbrokes, and they were saying here the best possible outcome for bookies. And he says, was that because um, the, the eventual commission president uh, was so left field, no one bet on her? Ladbrokes saying she wasn't even listed as a possible runner, so no bets were taken. That's the bookies having a laugh about this. But other people seeing this uh, a little bit more seriously. Um, look at this here. So the EU Council nominating von der Leyen and uh, all but ignoring the spits and candidate process is detrimental to democracy, says Bastian there. He's a, he's a journalist and a commentator. Then look at this from Andrea on Twitter saying, not voted, not chosen by citizens. Hashtag not my commissioner. Really strong feeling there. We've got other people here. Frederica here, Frederica Volker on Twitter, uh, saying no disrespect, particularly to the, the woman who will now be the Commission president. Uh, hope she does a better job than she does in Germany. Interesting. Um, Frederica is from Germany there. But she's saying the Spitz and candidate system was important and democratic. And to throw it away like that is disrespectful. There's a lot of people feeling this. I mean, gosh, we've got a campaign group here saying the same. We've got another commentator here saying I could go on and on. Really, really important to say people are feeling that the Spitzenkandidat system, all in all, people were let down by that and the way it was talked up in the run-up to the election. One thing I do want to say, though, have a look at this. If you are on social media and you may want to hear from your new commission president, do not fall for a swathe of fake accounts that have been popping up. This is one of them. The official account will be marked by a blue tick. This is something other commentators are saying. Uh, until recently, of course, um, uh, von der Leyen was not on Twitter. Today she tweeted for the first time, but ignore any accounts without the official tick. So what about people speaking up for her? Are there anybody? Yes, there are. Deborah Cole summarizing uh, some German commentators saying, well, actually, her appointment, it's a win for women, it's a win for relations across the continent, and it's a win for Europe. And indeed, many people, many leaders, including the ambassador to the EU from America, congratulating the commission president and the other appointees. Other people, too, are saying two women are now at the top. The other, of course, being Christine Lagarde. So it's not all negative. And indeed, when there is criticism, it's not necessarily about the people. It's about the process and the way the spits and candidate system was talked up to then be, well, walked away from, it would seem. All right, thank you for that, uh, Alex and our team in the Cube. And joining us now in the studio to discuss this are Svenja Hahn, a German MEP from the Renew Group, and still with us, Paul Tang, a Dutch MEP from the Socialist and Democrats Group. I'd like to start with a big picture here on, on what Alex uh, was reporting there on the trust and credibility that the institutions have now with the public. Do you think it is 
damaged beyond repair, as we see from, from all those comments? What do you think has happened there? Well, I do think um, the, on the good side, EU leaders managed to find an agreement. So this is something we can highlight as a positive thing. But unfortunately, they did not manage to find an agreement within the principle they set themselves. Uh, so it's kind of like a win-win-lose-lose situation. Um, and it's a very tough situation now. And we need to look, how can we move forward without having a deadlock? Uh, so you're, you're disagreeing? Uh, I, I think it's the job of the government leaders to agree at one point. So I don't think that's a, that's uh, that's so you don't positive. Think that's, okay. that's, that's part of their job description, I would say. Uh, so that they, but they, the fact that they chose to ignore democracy and chose to ignore the results of the European election, I think, is a truly bad thing and a slap in the face. So yes, they will undermine the. Uh, uh, the trust and credibility. Trust, but, it, it, but, but it also sets the stage for, the, uh, for five years on. So right. we are, when we are fighting now against von der Leyen, it's not just because it's von der Leyen, but it's about the process. What will we do in the, the, in the next five years? We won't have a, demo, a democratic well, process. The, so this is at stake here. The right. council, I mean, the council has the right to propose. They are uh, elected. But, Exactly, well. but it is still the parliament that elects. And that must so, reflect the results of the European elections. It does. That principle and, has been gone. And we agreed to work with the Spitzenkandidat. It is in some kind of reflecting on the result, because if you see it in that sense, it's someone from the biggest party. But I am not willing to simply give up on the Spitzenkandidat principle. Well, but right. as it stands now, the council has the right to propose. What i like to learn now is the ideas from Ms. van der Leyen, because I haven't heard them on the campaign trail. Is there an argument to be made though because because it's it's almost hard to imagine that leaders just gather together and deliberately said okay let's ignore uh, what is being built as the more the more democratic process is there an argument to be made that there is simply choosing this is politics they're simply choosing the best balance for 28 countries later on 27 but you, you know the best balance this is politics that's how no, you No, no no because there are principles at stake here the fact that the visa crowd countries have blocked mm -hmm. first Manfred Weber and now Franz Timmermans because the last one criticized uh, Poland and Hungary because they do not uphold the rule of law. I think that is fundamental. So you can't just say everything is tradable. The rule, democracy and the rule of law are not uh, to be traded. Mm -hmm. These are European principles and they should have been held high by the European Council. Okay. I think this situation perfectly now shows that we urgently need democratic reforms in the European Union, that we have a very written down principle and not only a gentleman's agreement principle and this is what I want to hear like I only see support from the Parliament for the proposal of the council if there's an agreement and commitment by Ms. von der Leyen and from the council to real democratic reforms in the European Union and then this current backlash can be turned into a long-term victory for democracy in the European Union Bob we need reform for are that. you now worried as both of your politicians representing the European Union that when you go out there talking to voters and they, they go well you know what you're, you're a pres representative of those institutions and I've just lost trust in you. Are you worried in that kind of... Of course, even the bookies can't predict who pops up uh, out, of this, uh, out of this backroom deal. So, let alone that the people know that. So, th this is predictability and reliability of European politics is at stake. So, so, you think people will think, oh, well, my vote doesn't matter anyway. Yeah, exactly. Is this, this where we're headed? Uh, no, I You're a bit more positive, I think. Uh, no, I, I think we need to make the best out of the situation. And as a MEP, I'm part of the directly elected uh, institution mm -hmm. in the European Union. And we need to take over this responsibility now because we're still the ones electing. And we have the most power right now before electing a commission president. That's and we need to make our voices heard. And if the council want to go forward with this proposal, mm. uh, they need to offer us something for that so this is now actually the time to turn this situation into a long-term victory for democracy in the European Union if there are because there was also a point reform. that you were making a poll that this kind of sets a tone for the next five years and that you know where and, the balance and, and of power the council, is as well. if the council can't agree on on five of the top jobs why do you, why do you think that in the two weeks time they mm. will make, come with important concessions uh, towards the European Parliament I think that's right. wishful thinking that's okay. my, that's my fear I wish it would differ so the decision it, it has divided clearly members of of the European Parliament. So we did talk to some MEPs today about the results and whether they think that the Spitzenkandidat process, which we've been talking about, is dead.
The deal was quite a big disappointment because not only that we lost the process of the Spitzen candidate, but we also don't have on top positions any name, any person that is coming from the central eastern part of Europe, neither from small countries. We were always in favour of the Spitzen candidate process. We would have preferred to see um, a candidate at the helm of the Commission that was uh, part of the Spitzen candidate process. I think we need to take decisions in the coming days and weeks and we'll have to see from there. Well, I think the uh, end result is a total win for France. I'm afraid as one of the representatives of a northern country that we're moving towards a transfer union within the Eurozone and that countries in the north will have to pay more to the south and this will all be organized by the people that have just been appointed. For the process, I think it's not good and I, I'm really disappointed uh, of this. I regret uh, that the Council and especially the, the French President uh, didn't support his uh, support for the, for the process of the Spitzenkandidat. I think the uh, outcome is uh, relatively satisfactory. That is, uh, there was at the beginning, there had been a tendency to silence and to marginalize the voices of smaller countries, particularly from Eastern Europe, and they didn't work. So I think the majority of MEPs wanted to stick to the Spitzenkandidat process. Um, so is it dead? Same question, is it dead? Not is yet. We have, Not yet. We, we have Not to fight yet. for it. This is what we, what we <laughs> exactly. agree upon. We have to okay. fight in the next two weeks, but the time is very limited. Yeah. And at the end, I think we have to reject von der Leyen, that's what we aim for, to topple her, brings on a new process that should in the end be democratic. But we can't let voters so do you go think out we without... So you still see a Spitzenkandidat in that opposition? A Spitzenkandidat can, uh, could uh, reappear, why not? We were close to a deal with Franz Timmermans as, one, uh, as, one, uh, as ch president of the European Commission, why not? Mm -hmm. Or we, e at least with a democratic answer. Because accepting von der Leyen would send a message that the parliament doesn't want. Is that, is that what's happening? Yeah. I think we need to use the time now to agree to real reforms in a written procedure so that we have in not only a gentleman's agreement on the Spitzenkandidat principle, but a Spitzenkandidat with real transnational election lists. Mm -hmm. That is what we need to work for, in my opinion. And this is a commitment I want to see from the Council and Ms. van der Leyen. All right, but you're, you're confident, Paul, that it's not gonna, she's not going to get through. If they can't agree in, on top jobs, they can't <laughs> agree on uh, transnational lists in uh, two weeks' time, no. All right, okay, we'll see. We'll, we'll watch that closely. Coming up on Raw Politics, migration standoff. Matteo Salvini's rescue boat crackdown takes a hit. What's his next move? That is after the break. Welcome back to Raw Politics. All right, we'll go to the migration showdown now on the Mediterranean, where one rescue boat is making political waves in Italy. Let's take a look. A setback for the Italian government's crackdown on NGOs, as charges against Sea Watch captain Carola Rackete are dropped. The German captain was arrested and charged with endangering lives after her vessel hit a patrol boat while illegally docking in Lampedusa with migrants on board. But the German got a sympathetic hearing from the judge who said she had been carrying out her duty to protect life and release her from house arrest. And that has angered Italian Deputy Prime Minister Matteo Salvini, who is taking a tough stance on migration, closing Italian waters to migrant rescue ships, and he took to Facebook to attack the ruling. Pessimo segnale, signor giudice. Se qualche giudice vuole fare politica, l'abbiamo detto, siamo in democrazia, si toglie la toga, si candida in Parlamento con la sinistra e cambia le leggi che non gli piacciono. But it's not all plain sailing for the captain of this ship. She's still facing charges of aiding illegal migration, and that could come with a 15-year prison sentence. And joining us to discuss this are Grace O'Sullivan. She's an Irish MEP from the Greens, and our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. So, Grace, I'll start with you. What's your reaction to the decision um, on releasing the German uh, captain there? I'm really very uh, happy to hear that uh, Carol has been released. I'd say it's a huge relief for Sea Watch because they were concerned, and as the clip said, 
Carole could have faced a charge of some 15 years in prison. But people like Carole and the crew of uh, Sea Watch are very committed uh, to their objectives of uh, supporting and helping people um, in humanitarian crisis. I mean, there was that one. So she was, she was, um, she was released because she, the, the the court was saying that she just she was doing her job. But at the same time, there is still the possibility, and it's breaking the law. There is the illegal uh, aiding illegal migration uh, charge that, she, that could be brought upon her. Yeah, I think, I think, I think. Um, we, let's look, stand back, and go. Uh, the Italians are in a very difficult position here, and I think mm -hmm. it's very easy, actually, for people in Brussels and indeed in northern they Europe. Bear the brunt at well, the end in of the northern day. Europe to kind of look on and say, "Well, oh, look at the Italians being, you know, uh, not being uh, very kind um, or and understanding or humanitarian sure. to to migrants." But ultimately, they're having to. They are on the front line. They're having to deal with this. It is clear that Matteo Salvini is popular in Italy for a reason, because of his stance on immigration, and. What, what is Rome crying out for? It's crying out for a European-wide settlement for migration. Mm. And what is not happening is any solution to that. So, in effect, you know, the law has to be upheld. And I think politicians here need to understand that while people may be doing admirable work in the Mediterranean, that actually the Italians do have a right to protect their border because Europe at the moment is not providing a strong enough external border. So, Grace, do you see that point of view? Like, yes, like no, I, 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 I do believe mm -hmm. absolutely that there needs to be more action taken on behalf of the European Union. And you're right, Italy is frontline. And there should be better burden sharing in terms of the migration crisis uh, affecting the whole of European un Union, but also in terms of the global issue of migration. So I absolutely agree that the U European Union should be doing more in this regard. Uh, but when it comes to the thing with uh, NGOs like Sea Watch, they are shining a spotlight on the issue. And moreover, they are saving lives. So well, more mean? than 300 people well, have died in the Mediterranean over the course of the last few years. And that's, like, I don't want to be standing over but that how do you kind of crisis. Well, what, what, oh, yeah. well, what, what do you think about the idea that actually these NGOs are encouraging people to risk their lives? I don't believe they are encouraging people. Because I think they're frontline services. These are rescue services. And the rescue in this instance are humans. They're families, their babies, their mothers, fathers, they're real people. And this is where we need to call for a real social what? Europe with but policies that support the support, uh, support uh, refugees what could, and migrants What could Matteo Salvini's next crisis. move be? I mean, just to, j just to see, you, given the scenario he lost Well, I mean, I think, I think politically he, he is going to stand his ground because it, it's not doing him any domestically mm -hmm. damage with his voters back home. If anything, you know, we have seen La Liga's support grow uh, the stronger his rhetoric gets. But at the same time, you know, it is going to get to a point where... Are we going to see a Europe-wide deal on migration? So far, we haven't. Um, actually, bizarrely, the, the major obstacle to it is to be found in Eastern Europe, who are some of Martina Slovenia's, Matteo Slovenia's uh, closest allies uh, in places like Poland and Hungary. Because they won't accept Because they quotas. won't accept quotas right. for migrants. And actually, we have seen some countries take uh, some of the migrants that have been uh, landed in Lampedusa. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, this is going to be a continually testing political uh, project for, for the, the European Union. Mm. Because migration is not going to end overnight. Exactly. Absolutely. All right, well, if not properly addressed indeed, the crisis in the Mediterranean will become a crisis for the European Parliament or continue to be, in fact, a crisis for the Parliament. And that was the message of Open Arms Mission leader Annabel Montes Mir. The Spanish captain docked here in Strasbourg earlier today aboard one of the rescue rafts. She he uses to pick up people at sea. And speaking out against the increasing criminalization of NGO boats, she said no price could be put on saving lives and forced to choose, it would always be life. She spoke to Euro News from her boat earlier. The problem now is that uh, it's risky is if we talk about legal stuff, about legal things, about how Europe wants to stop us. Uh, they don't care how. Uh, how the only thing is they want to stop organizations uh, with accusation, legal accusations, with possible jail, jail sentences, with uh, enormous fines that we cannot imagine. So is that what we're going to see until we find a European solution? Some are calling it criminalization of NGOs, as, as uh, the captain was saying. Is that what we're going to see in the meantime until the EU finds a solution? Is this something new? 
I mean, NGOs have been involved in this kind of civil disobedience for many, many decades. So this isn't something new with regard to NGOs. Mm. But I think you will see NGOs wanting to be involved. And uh, NGOs like Artists on the Grenze, Doctors Without Frontiers, they're out there, fr their front line. Sea Watch is the same. You know, they're very responsible in how they run their operations. There's no doubt about it. They feel they're protecting lives, and they are protecting lives. But, 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 I, I think we also have to be very clear, there are also political actors in this. Right, and, yes. and this, what it boils down to, is that they are taking a side in this political argument, just like Matteo Salvini mm -hmm. is, and so they are not just simply as good of work as they're doing in the Mediterranean, kind of independent arbiters who are doing good for the it sake of doing good. It is fair to use the word politicalization. Well, they're involved in a political battle. I think it's fair to say that there is politicalization. Okay. I mean, whether they should be judged by uh, under criminal law, if they bring Break law. I mean, like anyone, like any yeah. organisation, they have but to. They have to fulfil. And yes, but, okay, last word to but Grace. Carol has been released. The judge in the case, mm -hmm. Judge Vela, has actually uh, offered her release. So that is uh, a positive outcome so far. All right. Okay. I'm sure this debate is going to continue, especially here in the Parliament. Well, coming up, there's been a lot of criticism on how the names for EU top tops were put forward. Now we want to know what you think. Is EU democracy dead? We want to hear from you. Your call is coming up at 7 p.m. local time. The information is on your screen. You can call us at 0800-3333-7002 and get in on the debate using the hashtag Raw Politics. Our lives are opening soon after the break. British MEPs gone too far. I think they did go too far. They are there to represent Britain. And, and they should be a bit more serious. Because you wanted to run. To, to be a member of this institution. They have a right to do that. I'm for protest rights, so nothing you can do about it. But at the same time, I think it was uh, showed bad, bad taste. I wonder, will they now give that back to the salary as well? I think it was very unethical and disrespectful. And I never, never, never expected this from the UK. That was some of the highlights there from a lively Royal Politics Your Call last night. And we're doing it all over again tonight, 7 p.m. Central European time and 6 p.m. if you're in the UK and Ireland. And Darren is hosting and is still with us. And he will be joined by Irish uh, Green MEP Grace O'Sullivan. OK, again, three questions tonight. What is it, Darren? Three questions that we're really focusing on kind of I suppose politics, its mm -hmm. purest form inside the parliament uh, and indeed uh, in Brussels, given those decisions made yesterday, uh, asking kind of is democracy dead, given the fact that it, it's not been decided by MEPs, but rather, or indeed it must be said by you at home, but rather by uh, people in Brussels. Uh, and also they said, but what do you want to see this place change in your lives over the next five years? Let's have a look at tonight's hot topics. But the big questions to the people who want to lead the European Commission. Six candidates for the position of President of the European Commission will make their pitch for Europe's top job. These were the lead candidates to be the next Commission President. They debated, made their pitches and campaigned across Europe. But now not one of them will take up Europe's top job. The lead candidate process was brought in in 2014 to try and democratise the election of the Commission President. But it took EU leaders just three days to scrap it and propose their own Commission President candidates. We have chosen two women and two men for the four key positions. So we're asking, is EU democracy dead? And the new German Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, isn't the only one taking up a new job. The Belgian Prime Minister, Charles Michel, is going to be President of the European Council, while French lawyer Christine Lagarde is heading up the European Central Bank. Meanwhile, Spanish Foreign Minister, Jose Borrell, will take up the big diplomatic role in Brussels. And the Italian, David Sassoli, was today elected as President of the European Parliament. But there are no Eastern Europeans at the top table. So we want to know, has Eastern Europe been shafted? And as Jean-Claude Juncker kisses goodbye to Europe's top job, 
His successor will inherit a European Union more fragmented and divided than ever. With voters demanding action on issues from the economy to unemployment and immigration. But what do you want the next European Commission President to focus on? We're asking you what you want to see the EU do for you over the next five years. Come on Europe, get involved in the debate. Is EU democracy dead? Has Eastern Europe been shafted? What do you want the EU to do for you over the next five years? And you know what to do? Uh, pick up the phone. It is free. 00800 333 Why would you not want to talk to us uh, tonight? <laughs> uh, you can email us at rawpoll at euronews.com. You can find us on Skype as well, or indeed on Facebook, where we're broadcasting live, and Twitter. Use the hashtag rawpolitics to leave your comments. Yes, let's talk about what you were saying, Darren, the politics in its purest form. We're talking about democracy here because, uh, you know, uh, the, the choice of the, of, of, the, of, of the people for the top jobs, there's a lot of questions on the process and what the process it didn't follow, in fact. So is EU democracy dead? What do you, you're a new MEP. Yeah. You're in here this place for the first time. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I suppose the lead candidates, the Spitzen candidate, that process allowed the candidates to go out into the field and to meet the citizens and to speak about uh, their aims and ambition for Europe. It's, I think it's a pity that in a way that process has been shafted now and new members have been brought in. I, I, I think it's a big job that is on offer here. And I know with any job, you look at people's competencies, you look at their experience. I worked in HR for years for Greenpeace International. I mean, you wouldn't just pull anyone in. So I think it's really important that the candidates that are there now present. We will have tonight, um, Ursula von der Leyen will uh, present to the Green Group, as she probably will to many of the other groups as well. So at least we have a chance uh, to hear. Uh, to question. To question. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's, it's, also, it's more than just a face-to-face. -face. Well, be a bit of depth and yeah, but the, the real problem here, the problem is that Europe is trying to engender a sense of European identity. The European Union is trying to create like a cross-continental political system. Mm. I mean, they're talking about introducing transitional lists, uh, transnational lists, lists yeah. uh, for example. But the problem, and this is where it is a real problem for democracy, is you have to feel a connection. One of the reasons that Euroscepticism exists and is potentially on the rise is that people feel very, very far away from Brussels. And that is not helped but by the fact that there is no... Most people don't know who these people I mean, are. They are they They've are never heard of them I, before. Uh, yeah. And so That's right. uh, the attempt that was made yeah. during the election campaign to try and make a connection between the people who might get these jobs, mm -hmm. like Manfred yeah. Weber and Franz Timmermans, yes. that you were encouraging like people to get to, to the know people. them, yeah. And then you pull the rug away and say, no, actually, it's all these other yeah, people that yeah. no one's heard of. Yeah, no, that is a problem. There's no doubt about it, but because there has been time to present, and now sure. it, it, they've been shafted more or left. So that, that isn't good in well, terms of voting. Well, why don't, okay. why don't, are you going to stand no, up? So, are you going to stand I'm, up and, and, vote, say, and say, vote against them? Yeah. 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 But can I say that when okay. I was on the campaign trail, it was really important that all right, the obvious, to... the deficit between the the citizens and this the This conversation is going to continue, in fact, after this program on your call. Again, you know what to do. You should get in touch and join this conversation. The phone number is 0800-333-337002. You can email us, rawpoll at euronews.com, or on social media, use the hashtag rawpolitics, and you can also search for us on Skype. Okay, now for tonight's uh, raw moment, let's take a look at what the woman who looks set to replace Jean-Claude Juncker got up to as German Defence Minister. Let's take a look. Does she have the credibility seeing that? Or I think she was criticized, in fact, for posing sometimes with, with the military 
Yeah, I mean, she, well, in this, uh, I mean, I was saying she's not fashion. very well known. She is very well known in Germany, she for is. example. And I have to say, actually, looking at that, you know, in comparison to every single man that has held the job before, there in the go. very essence that she'll be the first woman commission president, potentially, um, is a remarkable moment in itself. OK, but very quickly. If I look Grace. at the, those <laughs> images, I think of the great Europe peace project and I All would right. like to see someone a defense okay. minister who is You'll defending have to hold that peace. Thought. Okay. Well there you go. Okay, thank you everyone for watching and do stay tuned for Europolitics your call.